1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven, as was the as was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have become the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Lord, today as we continue on in the study and we, we look to your truth and we desire to understand what you have for us, I pray that our eyes would be open, that our hearts would be receptive, that our, our minds would comply, and Lord, that your spirit would teach us. Lord, that we would be in a better place in knowing you and in walking with you and serving you ultimately and giving you glory with these lives because of what your word has for us. Because we come together and experience the presence of your spirit. Because we give of ourselves as people who, who are into worshiping you and loving you. Because we de desire for you to be known and glorified in the midst of our lives. Lord, because we want the world around us to know that you are important to us. So, Lord, may your work be done. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, in the beginning with Adam and Eve, I think things were going pretty well. You know, it happens really quick, Genesis 3, the fall of man. But before that, I think things went pretty good. God walked with them. God fellowshiped with them, ruled over them. He gave them responsibilities. They fulfilled those responsibilities. But as we know, after some time, they forsook one of those responsibilities, a big one. They disobeyed. They were given the chance to, you know, this one thing, don't do this one thing. There was one don't in their life, and they, they did it. And they defied God. And when they did that, they, they introduced something into humanity like a sickness. And it came in and it rendered man incapable of attaining the condition required for him to hold and maintain ongoing fellowship with God. There was separation. This sickness, which we call sin, manifests itself in so many different ways. But as we look at the early history of man, you know, one of the biggest ways we see it manifesting itself is in, in man saying, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it in my own strength. I'm going to do it in my own power. And they try to please God and to cover their, their, their own sin and their own power, and it didn't work. They tried to sew together some leaves, and they said, you know, we've done a bad thing. We're... We're naked and we've covered our shame. But don't worry, Lord, look, we've covered our shame. We've done a good job. We've sewed together some leaves. I'm sure these are going to hold up really well to the wear and tear of life. But God let them know that wasn't good enough. God let them know that what happened here was serious. And so for the first time that we know of, in the account of human history, blood was shed. God made for them tunics of skin. And they had to wear these, and, and there was a message there that this trespass, this sin was so great to even cover your shame before God, blood had to be shed. And this message continued to be preached to humanity for thousands of years. To cover your sin, blood must be shed. This is how serious this separation is. And yet humans continue to do things according to their own wisdom and according to their own power. You know, the first 11 chapters of Genesis show us historically 
that man's attempts to do things his own way, well, generally ends in disaster. They tried again and again to employ their own concepts of of gathering together a society and leading that society and doing what they felt was right. You know, God had this model laid out. He, He ruled in perfection over Adam and Eve. He rules in perfection over His angels, over creation. And humanity says, we can do that too. We can become the God or we can become the King and we can rule in perfection over people. And and it, it didn't work well for them. In fact, it still isn't working well. So God decided to teach them about His kingdom. You know, we jump way ahead to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, where we get that passage about the fullness of time. In the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. That term fullness of time basically means when the time was right. In the perfect timing of God, the second Adam appeared. And He wasn't merely a living being like the first Adam. He was a life-giving spirit. He wasn't made at all like Adam was made. He pre-created he, or he pre-existed his birth. He pre-existed all creation. And, and at the same time, you know, he, everything he did was right and, and true. And he lived in the flesh. But he, he didn't live in the flesh as one who was made. He didn't live in the flesh as one who fell and who sinned and who was weak. He lived in it in perfection. And he came to the earth from his hell, heavenly dwelling place. And when the time was right, he went back to his heavenly dwelling place. So Jesus came down here. And He came down here when the time was right to make things right. Because mankind couldn't do it. Their kingdoms kept failing. Their kingdoms kept doing things wrong. And we look at history and kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall and nations grow and shrink and some disappear. Mankind could not make this method of kingdom rule work. And it it took a while for mankind to be given the lesson. I want to say understand the lesson, but I think that's wrong. It took a while until God presented enough evidence to humanity so that they might be able to understand the lesson. And to this day, most of humanity is still raging against that lesson. And they're like, we can do it. We can employ God's methods in our own strength and we can make it happen our own way. And the story of the great lesson started in Genesis 12 In Abraham, God chose to raise up a nation. And through his son Judah, he chose to raise up a lineage of kings. And and from this lineage, we get guys like David, who is a man after God's own heart. And we get guys like Solomon, who was considered to be the wisest man to ever live. And even as David and Solomon were men who knew and loved the Lord, and, and they wrote parts of our own Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit, they were still incredibly broken men. They both rebelled. They both made bad mistakes. And as we follow this lineage of of son after son, we we don't find it it very redeeming. Eventually, the whole system was dismantled. You know, God said, you guys, you just can't do this. You keep sinning. You keep giving yourselves to idols. You keep rebelling. And so it was all dismantled. They were hauled off into captivity. And that kingdom failed. God's kingdom in Israel failed. And they failed for two reasons. And the reasons that they failed are the same reasons that kingdoms today fail. Reason number one, there was a lack of spiritual preparation by Israel. You know, things started for Israel when they crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land under the leadership of Joshua and the elders. And when they did that, things were going great for them. They had a great season of obedience and loving and knowing and following the Lord. But after Joshua died and after the the elders who served along with Joshua died. We get this in Judges chapter 2. They said at that point, Israel, well, things went south for them. They forgot the Lord. They abandoned His ways and they served idols. The miracle of possessing the land only carried them through one generation. And then it all fell apart. And this for quite some time became their pattern as a nation. They would pull it together then it would all fall apart. They would pull it together and then it would all fall apart. The second reason why their kingdom failed is because it was dependent upon human leaders. Well, what else do we have? 
Well, in this fallen world where man has declared he's going to do it his own way, we have human leaders. And it was dependent upon them. King David, great leader, but he committed adultery and murder. King Solomon, great leader, but he forsook the worship of God and he gave himself over to idols, even building idolatrous places of worship right there in Jerusalem to please his wives, and he participated in that. God let both of these guys you know, lead and they, they were his, his children and he spoke through them. And yet even as they were favored by Yahweh, they were still failures in their job to lead. So when the kings failed, the prophets began to look forward to something greater. And when you read the words of the prophets who were speaking out in contrast to the failures of their own nation, They looked forward not to a king who was a man who would fail, whose spiritual preparation was weak. They looked forward to a king who was God, who was perfect. Isaiah says it best in chapter 33, verse 22, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, and He will save us. And the prophets were saying this. Looking forward to something better. And so when Jesus came and declared the kingdom of God that John the Baptist was declaring before Him and that that his, fo- his followers, his disciples, his apostles, and, and especially Paul, declared after him, it wasn't the kingdom where a man would become the leader of Israel and throw out the oppressors. That wasn't the kingdom that they were preaching. Jesus declared the kingdom that the prophets looked forward to, the one where Yahweh is our judge, Yahweh is our lawgiver, Yahweh is our king, and He will save us. That is the kingdom that they looked forward to, the one where God is king and savior. And even still, Jesus there with these guys, three years of ministry, walking with them, them following Jesus, listening to His teaching, even after all this time, many of them still didn't get it. They were still looking for a kingdom where God would put a man over Israel and they would throw out the oppressors and they would have their sovereignty again. That's what they were still looking for. And so when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the Lamb who was coming in for the Passover, Jesus, our Passover Lamb, entered in on that day you know, when, when all the other lambs are brought in to the city to, to, be, to be distributed for Passover, Jesus came in on that day too. And there was this great, what is called the triumphant entry. Everyone's like, yeah, Jesus is coming. What's he going to do? He's going to City Hall and he's overthrowing the Romans. He's throwing them out of here. And he's going to be our king and he's going to establish the sovereignty of Israel. And they were excited. And they cried out, Hosanna. Save now. But it was a disillusioned demand because Jesus didn't go to City Hall and throw out the leaders. He went to the temple and threw out the hypocrisy there. Even his own followers were confused. You know, three days after he died, he rose again and I guess he's just kind of walking around, resurrected Jesus. He finds a couple guys, and he's like, I know these guys. These guys have been hanging with me for a couple years. I'm going to check out what they're doing. He walks up alongside of them and, and uh, disguised himself. And he's like, what's going on? It's like, oh, we're so bummed out. Why? Jesus died, and it's been three days. And it says in Luke 24, 21, we had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. But he didn't. He died. And then right before he ascended into heaven, I mean, these guys had been seeing resurrected Jesus. Lots of people. It says earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, over 500 people have seen resurrected Jesus. They've interacted with him. They ate breakfast with him. And he's about to leave them. And they asked again, Acts chapter 1, verse 6, they asked him again. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel. And then not all the versions have this, but it's in the original Greek. It says that Jesus did a face palm. (laughs) They still thought that the kingdom that failed in the Old Testament was going to be restored for them right then. After all of this, they still thought, Lord, now... Can we sit next to you and rule with you now? Can this happen? But Jesus didn't come to immediately set up his throne. He came to fix what was broken. 
You know, why did it keep failing? A lack of spiritual preparation. Why did it keep failing? It, it was dependent upon the weakness of sinful men. Jesus came to fix what was broken. The kingdoms which were run by human leaders failed because of their spiritual situation, because their frailty as, as humans who were infected by the sickness of sin. And Jesus came to bring redemption and forgiveness and healing and power. And He came to fix us spiritually, not so that we can become kings, but rather so that we can be the proper subjects for the proper king that Isaiah looked forward to. His kingdom will be one day established, seen, and experienced in the flesh. It'll be here. But now it's spiritual. Well, okay, well then I don't have to worry about it, right? I'll just worry about it when I see it. Well, I think that's how we have been acting as a church. But now we're part of that great spiritual healing that God is doing of a, of a godly and spiritual nation. We're being prepared. We're being prepared for what God has for us in the here and now, and we're being prepared for what God has for us in the eternal, which is yet to come. You know, we have learned what Jesus' very own disciples didn't get. His kingdom is not inherited by flesh and blood, which defines for us the first thing we really want to talk about today. God's kingdom is quite different than the kingdoms that we have here on the earth. God's kingdom is different than our kingdom. This opening passage, 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 50, gives us a comparison between Adam and Jesus. One was created out of dirt. He was from beginning and end, flesh and blood. But Jesus was not created. He was eternal from heaven. He was born of an earthly mother, conceived by the Holy Ghost. He conquered the confines of His own death. He conquered sin in the grave. He rose again. He returned to heaven, glorified. And the purpose of this comparison, I mean, there are many things that we can bring into this. Great theological discussions and great eloquent things can be said about this comparison, but, but basically I think it boils down to this, and it's the message that we get in the whole letter of Hebrews. It comes down to this. Jesus is better than man. Jesus is so much better. It's not even worth comparing. And Jesus' kingdom is better than man's kingdom, and you will not inherit Jesus' kingdom the way that you would inherit man's kingdom. And so to understand that, well, how would one inherit man's kingdom? And how is it different that we would inherit Jesus' kingdom? Well, we inherit Jesus' kingdom spiritually. In Mark 10, if you want to turn there, we're going to look at verses 13 and through 15. But in Mark 10, we learn that we receive it with simple faith and with innocence. Mark 10, beginning at verse 13. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. Get those kids out of here. That wasn't in there. That's my interpretation. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So we see two distinctions between the kingdom of man and God's kingdom. You know, man's kingdom is a matter of conquering. A matter of taking by strength and cunning and political you know, wisdom and, and, and might. We don't go and get God's kingdom the way an imperialist society would, where you just go and you would conquer it and you would take it and you would make it your own. Instead, it says we receive it. You don't go and take it. You don't go and conquer it. You receive it. That means it's being given to you. Secondly, we don't receive it because we are the best or we are the strongest, or we are the smartest, or we are the most eligible candidate, or we're famous. Look throughout history. Who was always conquering other nations? It was some great, mighty leader. And there was a reason why they were great and mighty. There was wisdom. There was strength. There was charisma. There was this leadership skill in them. And people would follow them, and they would go, and they would conquer. Well, not God's kingdom. It's not dependent upon any of that. It says you receive it, you don't conquer it. You receive it not like a great leader, but you receive it like a child. What does that mean? A child? 
Well, children have crazy faith. At least until they're about nine or ten, man, they will believe anything their parents tell them. And so that's a lot of fun sometimes. They have crazy faith. They've not been jaded by life. They've not been spoiled by their experiences with people in the world. They have crazy faith and they have innocence. Unfortunately, we adults do not so easily have those things. You know, believing in the saving power of Jesus is not something that we are capable of doing in the flesh. This is something we're capable of because the Holy Spirit enables us to do it. It's a supernatural, miraculous thing to realize that we need Jesus. We need salvation. It's a supernatural and miraculous thing to put our faith in Jesus and to receive that salvation as our own. The Holy Spirit gives us the faith and Jesus, through His complete forgiveness, gives us innocence. And so through that supernatural work, we, we get what children have instinctually. Crazy faith and innocence. It's not inherited by flesh and blood. It's only received by faith and innocence. The next way that God's kingdom is different than our kingdom is the kingdom of heaven is not defined in corruption. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is speaking some hard words to the church. Difficult words of correction. In Corinth, they were creating for themselves a false idea of Christianity. They were, they were making the mistake that many people mistake. They begin to think wrongly about God, and then they begin to think wrongly about what God would have them do, and then their religion, their idea of walking spiritually becomes completely something different than what God intended for them. And they were gaining confidence in themselves and in their possessions and in their wealth and in their positions. Basically, they were becoming very, uh, a, a religion that was very much focused on self and who we are and what we can become. They were gaining confidence in their own wisdom and their own strength. We are powerful people. We have great possessions. We are great leaders. We feel really good about ourselves. We are really puffed up in who we are. They were also boasting in their open embrace and acceptance of sexual immorality in their midst. We are not going to judge, but we're gracious and for, gracious and forgiving of the sexual immorality in our midst. In fact, it's not immoral at all. It's not our place to judge. It's not loving. Man, that sounds familiar. Paul was writing a letter to these people in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Man, I, that letter should get distributed here in America today. They were surrounding themselves with counselors who were, were encouraging them to embrace the self-centered, compromising faith. Man, this is familiar. But Paul, in contrast, gives them his example. Okay, that's you guys. Y'all are awesome and rich and powerful and puffed up and open-minded. That's you guys. But not me. That's not me. I'm... I'm in a place of complete dependence upon God. Where they said they were wise, Paul said, you guys are so wise, me, I'm a fool for Christ. Where they said they were strong, Paul said that he was weak. And this is what he did, his comparison. This is what you guys are like, this is what I am like. And he told them in verse 15, you have countless guides, but not many fathers. You have people whom Paul defines later as being arrogant, in verse 19, who are guiding you in these ways and in these ideas, but you don't have any fathers. You don't have someone who will come and speak with fatherly authority to you, who will bring correction. And they were being led astray with words. And Paul told them that when he comes, he will not be interested in the words that these arrogant guides are speaking, but he will be interested in their power. Will they have any power? Their, the implication is they won't have power. They'll have things which sound and look and, and seem really great in, in a societal way of thinking, but, but they won't have power. And he, and he brings it home in verse 20. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 20, where he says, For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. Hey, these people are coming to you, and they're all talk. They're all talk. They're all ideas. They're all concepts. They're all philosophies. But that's all it is. It's just talk. There's a lot of talk going on in the church. A lot of talk about 
personal comfort. Just tell me about how I can be comfortable. Just tell me about how I can be prosperous. Just tell me about how I can find that great position of, of leadership. Or, or, or tell me about you know, my personal ability, about how I can do anything if I put my mind to it. Tell me about how I can be socially acceptable. Let, send me out of here on Sunday morning feeling really good about myself. Talk about the wisdom of man. And then in all of that, talk about the culture having authority over the interpretation of God's word. But Paul's words are still as true today as they were then. And all of this talk might create some pretty impressive man-made kingdoms here on earth. Some great man-made kingdoms that, that, you know, have that are open on Sunday mornings and great things are, are happening there, but, but that's not where God reveals his power. There are always ideas coming in which are seeking to corrupt the uncompromised ways of God. That to turn it into something which sounds great, which does not, however, have any power. And even though they might look and feel more acceptable and impressive to our society, they are not the ways of God's kingdom. His kingdom is different than our kingdom. The next thing we want to talk about is God's kingdom is a daily priority. Scripture makes it clear this is something we are to come back on our, to on a regular basis. You know, last week we talked about the Lord's Prayer when Jesus said, this is an outline, this is a model, this is how you pray. And in that prayer he said, your kingdom come. We are to be praying for it, looking forward, hoping in it, having our minds attuned to God's kingdom. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 31 through 34. God's kingdom is a daily priority. Matthew 6, verse 31. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The number one priority today before we fret and stew about anything else, the number one priority today is to seek God's kingdom. We could interpret that differently. We could say the very first thing we do is that we would desire first God's kingdom over anything else. Or we also could interpret this to say we demand first God's kingdom before anything else. We seek it. We desire it. We demand it. This is our daily call to look for His rule and His reign over us every single day, to submit ourselves as His subjects every single day. And by faith, we promote God's rule in our lives you know, over the rule of our employers or, or our state or our country. We obey them as we would obey God. But His authority is the great authority. Daily, we are realign the, the real priorities of our spiritual kingdom over the temporary physical stuff that distracts us like food and water and Mickey Mouse watches. Don't worry about tomorrow. Today is enough. There's enough going on today. Tomorrow we'll, we will seek God's kingdom again. And we'll deal with tomorrow's stuff tomorrow. The next point, God's kingdom, is for God's people. In Matthew 21, Jesus shared a parable with the Pharisees and the scribes, the chief priests and the, and the Pharisees. I don't know if there were any scribes there. There may have been. And it was about a landowner who had this great vineyard and he had everything there to make the wine, the whole thing. And he leased it out for people, for tenants there. And, and when it was time to harvest the grapes, he sent a service out, go tell the tenants to get to work. This is what they're here for. Go tell them to get out there and to pick the fruit and to get to work and, and when the servants came to them, they, they beat up the servants. No, we're not going to do what we're supposed to do. And so he said, well, let's send out the servants again. So he sent out the servants again, and they beat up the servants again. You're like, this is like that wedding feast story. Yeah, very much like it. And then he said, I'll send out my son. So he sent out his son, and they're like, let's kill the son, then maybe we'll get this place for our own. And they killed him. 
And then Jesus presented this question to them. If you turn there, it begins in verse 40 of Matthew 21. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Now Jesus presented this to the chief priests and, and, and to the Pharisees. And this is their answer. The chief priests and the Pharisees said, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants and will give him the fruit that who will give them the the fruits in their seasons. They're like, they didn't even know they were talking about themselves. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, Have you ever read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it's it's is and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing fruit. And that's when they start realizing, wait a minute, taken away from us and given to people producing fruit. Are we the tenants who beat up the servants? Or are we the tenants who killed the son? Is that, that what you're saying? And the one who falls in the stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived, because finally, ding, the light bulb went off, that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Israel had a great responsibility. They had a job. Not to beat up servants, but to do what they were called to do. Solomon recognizes, he prayed this prayer in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 41 through 43. He, he, he prayed this prayer, and in it he recognized the truth that God had called his people, Israel, to, and he confessed this truth in his prayer, that Israel was to be a people of faith in whom God's blessing was to be present and evident to the people of the world around them. They would look at Israel and they'd say, look at God's great blessing upon these people. And this would cause foreigners to come to them and to pray to Yahweh. And the people of Israel had a responsibility to proclaim and to display the goodness of God. They didn't have to go out and tell everyone, God is great, look at us. They just had to be seen as being faithful. The world would have noticed it. And they would have come and they, they would have said, what is this that your God is doing for you? And they would have proclaimed His goodness. This was their job. To shine the light of God's glory in their obedience and their faithfulness to Him. And as people came, to proclaim that truth to them. It was their job to be a people of faith and obedience. It was their job to declare the name of God with the hope that they too would, would, would fear Him and know Him. It was their job when the harvest was ready to go out and to pick the grapes for their master. They had a job to do, but they didn't do it. And they, they turned inward and they disregarded the foreigners and they developed some, some, some religious kingdom ideas of their own. And when the kingdom of heaven came to them and the king was present in their midst, they killed him. The kingdom of heaven doesn't belong to people who claim it because they have some form of religious heritage. You know, how many people do we meet? You know, it's a little more prevalent in the South than where I come from in the Midwest, but how many people do we meet who just say, well, I'm a Christian because, you know, Uncle Bob's a preacher, or Grandpa was a preacher, or Daddy was a deacon, and I'm a Christian because our name is on the membership of such and such church in such and such a place. That makes me a Christian. How many people think that? How just this complete false reality of what it means to be a believer. It's as if you, you get to ride in on someone else's coattails or as if you get to get into heaven because your name is on a membership list somewhere. The kingdom of heaven does not belong to people who claim it because they have some form of religious heritage. The kingdom of heaven is given to people who are producing fruit. The kingdom of heaven is also given to those who are committed to do God's will. Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Not only that, but the kingdom of heaven is for people who are willing to actually step forward into it and to stop making stupid excuses. 
Luke 9, verse 62, Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Here in Luke 9, he had interacted with some folks who talked about serving him. It was all talk. Remember what Paul said about talk? The kingdom of heaven is not about talk, but in power. And these people were all talk. But in reality, they were more concerned with their homes and their inheritances and their own stuff. Jesus, I think following you is an excellent idea. I think that is a great idea. And you know what? I'm probably going to do that after I take care of my stuff. God's kingdom is for God's people. God's people produce fruit. God's people do God's will. God's people don't make excuses for why they are not stepping forward into it. And thirdly, God's people walk in a manner worthy of his kingdom. Now, Paul was all about this message, walking worthy. In 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 12, we, it says, We exhort each one of you and encourage you and charge you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So he says, you guys need to walk worthy in what you do in the flesh, in your daily life. You have to walk in a manner that is worthy. He makes it abundantly clear what it means to walk in an unworthy manner. He tells the church in Galatians. In chapter 5, in Galatians, chapter 5, verse 21, he tells the church in Ephesus. In chapter 5, verse 5, he tells the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, he warns the churches that those who willingly embrace and identify with and walk in the deeds of flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this is not to say that those who stumble into sin and weakness regrettably will be denied the kingdom of heaven. This speaks of those who continually and unrepentantly walk in these practices of sin, identify themselves according to them. God's kingdom is for us. But as his subjects, we are called to produce fruit. We are called to know his will and to do it. We are called to be serious about it. And we are called to walk in a worthy manner. Next point, God's work. Man's work in God's kingdom. This is the final point. This one's a little different. Man's work in God's kingdom is susceptible to corruption. We need to be careful. Our work in his kingdom can be corrupted. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 33, Jesus is speaking some parables here. And Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like three things. It's like a man who sowed good seeds in a field and the enemy came and sowed a bunch of weeds in the field and, and they grew up and he said, just let them all grow together. We'll harvest them, separate them in the end. And then he also said the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which grows into a tree that the birds perch upon. If you know anything about mustard seeds, they do become quite large plants, but they do not become quite large trees that birds can perch in. So they become something... It, it can become some, something much greater than what it's intended to be. And birds, which oftentimes speak of scavengers, can come and perch upon them. And finally, the kingdom of heaven is like a little leaven, which is put into a lump of dough, which, which, which goes on to leaven the whole lump. And the question arises, and, and it's there because I've yet to address it, what's the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? Jesus says here, the kingdom of heaven is like these things. And quite personally, I'm going to tell you, I don't really know, but I'll rely upon the question, the answer that someone else gave that was reasonable. He said the kingdom of God is simply the fact that God is the king over all the universe now and forever. That part I understand. He said the kingdom of heaven is the rule of God on earth over mankind, but that rule is through human instrumentality. And so if this definition is true, and I just offer it out there for your consideration, if this definition is true, then our part in carrying out God's kingdom, which might be defined as kingdom of heaven, maybe, well, it can become corrupted. And if you look around you in the world or look at church history, or even sometimes look at our own personal history of faith, we can see where we have seen, experienced, or been around or read about how corruption can come into the kingdom that, that man has, the responsibility that he has to God's kingdom to carry it out. And here's why it does make sense, though. Because all three of these parables, I believe, speak of 
corruption. That is, the kingdom of heaven is like something good that gets a bunch of weeds thrown into the midst of it. It's corruptible. What do we do with those weeds? Well, we have to be careful in how we deal with them. Or the kingdom of heaven is like a tiny seed which, which should grow into a plant of, of normal size, but then continues to grow into something so abnormally big that, that birds, which are figuratively spoken of as scavengers, come and they, they perch upon it and they scavenge from it. And finally, it's like a lump of dough that gets completely leavened by a little leaven. And consistently, the Bible always speaks of leaven as representing one thing over and over again, figuratively. Do, do you know what that one thing is? Sin. Well, why would it not speak of sin here then too? As stated earlier, the kingdom of God will not be defined in corruption. It will always be true. But as it is delegated to man, it can be tainted with corruption. Truth is always truth. No matter what we have to say about it, what is true remains true. The kingdom will always be true no matter how much we mess with it. But in the mess that humans bring, corruption can happen. False fruit can spring up. Things can be blown out of proportion for the sake of somebody's personal benefit. And of course, a little sin can spread through the midst of a lot of people and it can happen really quick if we're not careful. Now, I know the church has widely believed that these parables somehow speak of church growth. And I'm sure you've heard that. And maybe you're still holding on to that because you've always been taught that. And that's fine. It's it's a parable. You're not going to tell me a parable means one thing and one thing only. It's designed to teach a truth and to inspire us to think and to ponder and bring principled tr truth to it to, to, to bring our conclusion. But the church is always very eager to make things about the church. And in this case, they might be partly right. This is a warning, I believe, to the church. These parables are warnings. That if we are not careful, that we can corrupt the work that God has given us in his kingdom. You know, weeds are going to spring up in our midst. False fruit, false ideas are going to pop up in our midst. How do we deal with that? We need to do it carefully and cautiously so as not to pull up the good fruit along with the bad fruit. You know, things are going to run the risk of growing into something they shouldn't grow for the benefit of some person, and that shouldn't happen. Things are going to come into the midst and, and easily spread a sin which can easily spread amongst the people. That shouldn't be happening. And so we need to be careful. We can corrupt God's kingdom work in us and through us here on the earth, and may we not do that. So God's kingdom, last week we talked about two things. God kingdom, God's kingdom is getting close. It's at hand. And yet in some ways it's already here. God's kingdom is something to talk about. This week, we talked about his kingdom is different than our kingdom, or his kingdom is a daily priority, his kingdom is, is for God's people, and finally, man's work in God's kingdom is susceptible to corruption. You know, folks, if we are more minded to live these lives as subjects of King Jesus, I mean, if we think in those terms that I am a subject of my King Jesus and I do what he has called me to do, I believe we'll be more inclined to... to just fix some things that are broken. To break down walls of division in our midst. You know, there's a lot of false Christianity out there. Lots of it. Where people do not know Jesus and they do not embrace the gospel. They just get together under the name of Christianity. They have a religious experience. They don't believe in the absolute truth of the gospel. They go their own way. There's a lot of false Christianity. But there's a lot of true Christianity. And, and sometimes we throw up borders in the midst of, of true Christianity. And we throw up walls and we set up boundaries. You know, I've seen in the midst of the church where, where some Christians, their, their goal, their work, their, their life demand is to, is to bring bare a word of rebuke and destruction upon other Christians. If your greatest enemy in what you say and in what you do and what you write about in your blog, if your greatest enemy is another Christian, I think, I think the direction of the battle for you is a little off. You know, that, that's not our greatest enemy. In our tight-knit families, our, our communities where we, where we go to church together, we bond over many things. One of those things might be 
common doctrine. We bond over common doctrine. But as a nation, as a church universal, that is all those who believe in Jesus together, we, we are united not by common doctrine. We're united by something a little bigger than that. We're united by a common king. One that we all look to and agree upon as being a leader worthy of looking over us and bringing direction, of one who is to be loved, one we do not deny or fight against, one we do, we do not bring options in. It's like, well, Jesus, you're a great king, but maybe we should have an election. No, we would never even talk like that. If we have a kingdom-focused mind, it, it helps us to, to take the focus off of us and off of ourselves. In, in the comfortable, rich, and fancy world of the U.S. of A., it's easy to build up and be focused upon our own little kingdoms and you know, what is a kingdom anyway? If you've watched a Disney movie, a kingdom is always a castle and a city and a wall. And that's the center of the kingdom. And so we set up our castles and our cities and our walls and they exist in our homes. We have our little kingdom at home. They exist in our workplaces. We have our little kingdom at the workplace and, and, our, and we have our little kingdom and how, we, how we, you know, we believe with politics and government. We have our little kingdom with, with our church and they all exist in unique separation of one another. And once again, this is not what it looks like to be a kingdom-minded Christian. For in our kingdom, there is only one castle. There is one center of power, one center of truth, one center of justice, of hope, and of salvation. Jesus is our center. And everything else comes after that. God wants us to have lives that are in harmony with the purpose He created us to live. He gives us balance. He centers us upon Him, calling us on a daily basis to seek Him, to demand Him, to desire Him, first and foremost, before anything else. He calls us to keep that focus in our homes and in our jobs and with our votes and with our church communities. Now the question could be asked, well, practically, how does this work? Well, in our homes. How can my life honor my king? How can my kingdom of God be first in my home? What, what changes at home as I am inspired by the hope of a nearing kingdom? What changes? What changes at home as I find reason to talk about his kingdom? What changes at home as I promote the ways of God over the ways of man? What changes if I make it something that I demand first and foremost over the physical needs of food and shelter? I seek first what God has for me. What changes as I live a worthy life, stepping forward sincerely with my hand to the plow, not just talking about it, but actually doing it? And as I am aware of how corruption can creep into my midst and I'm cautious of that, what changes in the midst of my home, of my workplace? of the places where I go and the things that I do. How will these principles change my idea of church? How will it change my attitude towards you know, my country? How will it change the things um, that go on where I work? You know, it's my opinion that it, it will change significantly. If we become people who are more centered upon Jesus, I believe it will bring more unity to us, help break down the walls which divide us. I believe it will bring balance and harmony to our lives. I, I believe it will bring us as individuals into that place where our lives are, are daily focused on God for the purpose of bringing glory to God. And I pray that this would be something that, that, that we mull over, that we meditate upon, that we pray about. I pray that the framework of our spiritual lives with God and with other believers and with the daily work, I pray that these things would find order and that they would find purpose in the understanding and the recognition of God's kingdom.